Uh, my name is Jennifer Leaning, and I'm the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. And on behalf of that center, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the opening of this conference entitled 21st Century National Identification Systems, Data Politics Protection. Uh, my happy duty is to thank several people. Um, I'd first like to thank the originator of this process that led to the conference, Dr. Deborah Rose, an epidemiologist and biostatistician, visiting scholar with us at the FXB Center, a very good friend to the Harvard School of Public Health, and a thought leader on national identity systems. I'd also like to gratefully acknowledge Professor David Hunter, interim dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, for his presence here at the opening session of this conference. His vision in recognizing the potential of this conference and his untiring support throughout the planning process has been remarkable. We thank him most deeply. The chief strategist behind this conference, whom you will all have a chance to meet and talk with during the next day and a half or so, is Professor Jacqueline Baba, a close colleague and director of research for the FXB Center. We are immensely thankful to her for her unstinting commitment to excellence and her courteous but distinct insistence on intellectual acuity in all aspects of preparation of the program agenda and selection of panelists. You may have already discerned through the carefully parsed nature of the conference title that within this vast topic area are several themes implicated and often in conflict with each other. As a center on human rights, working closely with other faculties and centers at Harvard in organizing this event, we deliberately reached out to people who could speak thoughtfully with deep experience and analytic acumen on particular aspects along the various fault lines in this topic. There are virtues and hazards <clears throat> within every line of approach, identity versus anonymity, security versus privacy, surveillance versus access, knowledge versus safety, coherence versus liberty. Societies, each with their own historical and cultural experiences of the self and community, are now confronting the opportunities and pitfalls associated with new and ever more powerful technologies for tracking, identifying, and annotating every individual in every country on Earth. These are early but already pivotally imprinting years of the 21st century. The discussion we have organized to take place now here at Harvard could possibly serve as a starting point for a larger conversation the originators of this conference knew must begin to take place worldwide. I extend best wishes to all of you in attendance and to the panelists for a most vigorous, productive, and fascinating time ahead. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deborah Rose, who will make some opening remarks. Deborah, please. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd like to thank Jennifer and Jackie and Mahader and Michael and David, and I'll come up with a bigger list tomorrow. Um, welcome, bienvenido and Aquaba, and I'm sorry I don't have more languages. I am very happy to welcome you all to this conference. What started out with as what seemed to be a simple idea has grown into a three-day conference with over 20 speakers and more than 150 people registered to attend. I look forward to seeing what we learn and develop together. This topic has many levels and many of them are relevant to events in today's news. I'd like us to pause and remember the recent victims in Paris, Beirut, Nigeria, and all those everywhere whose safety, rights, and even lives are being so violently snuffed out. The other person that I, I absolutely have to mention is Julio Frank, the 
previous dean of the School of Public Health, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, who has left us in body but not necessarily in spirit. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dean David Hunter with the um, advice from Julio that David is Dean, not acting Dean. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah, and good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our conference, 21st Century Identification Systems, organized by the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We're delighted to have you all here to participate in this forum on national identification systems. And I thank you all for coming to contribute your ideas and uh, contribute to the discussion of these issues that are of central importance in our current troubled world. This conference addresses issues raised by the increasing use of national identification systems around the world. States as different as India, Norway, Brazil, and Nigeria have developed national identification systems in recent times. In some countries, these systems build on comprehensive birth and civil registration records that have been developed over centuries. In some countries, these are replacements for failing or very limited registration infrastructure. National identification has been used to strengthen financial inclusion, uh, at least in part by our former dean, Julio Frank. Also to strengthen voter participation and delivery of government services. Parallel to these and other practical uses are scholarly and political debates about the salient features of personal identity, the competing requirements of personal privacy and national security, and the relationship between national identification and sustainable development. Several major global stakeholders are keenly involved with these issues as they address the need for effective policies to close the identification gap. UNICEF, UNHCR, and the World Bank, among others, have developed structured efforts to improve access to legal identity, recognizing it as an instrument in promoting development. These efforts are reflected in the inclusion of an identification target in the newly agreed upon sustainable development goals. We hope this conference will provide a forum for us to contribute to the evolving discussion of the implications of identification systems for development, health, and access to services. Over the next day and a half, you'll hear from researchers, political leaders, and policy innovators on topics that range from the uses of big data to ethical and human rights issues relating to different identification systems. To fully address the complexity of the topic, we've assembled an interdisciplinary roster of speakers and collaborators, including experts in law, social science, public health, and the humanities. As a public health institution committed to producing powerful ideas that improve the lives and health of people around the world, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health is delighted and proud to host what promises to be a fascinating intellectual exploration and discussion. This conference is the culmination of months of hard work by many. I'd like to thank the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights for taking the lead in this important event. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy and the Harvard South Asia Institute, both of whom provided guidance and programmatic assistance throughout the planning progress process. This event would not have been possible without the vision, passion, engagement, and generous support of Deborah Rose, an alumna and close friend of the Harvard Chan School. Deborah represents that rare combination, a highly accomplished scholar with deep expertise in health systems and data analysis, and a sophisticated and engaged citizen committed to an ethical and inclusive global vision of social justice. We're truly lucky to have her as one of our co-chairs. Thank you, Deborah, for all you've done and continue to do. On behalf of the Harvard Chan School, I extend a very warm welcome 
It's a real pleasure to see so many of you here. I'm confident this event will make a significant contribution to the issues under discussion, and that it will serve as a starting point for a larger dialogue, a dialogue that I hope the Harvard Chan School will remain very much engaged in the future. So with that, let the conference begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, this opening panel sets the stage for our discussion with some of the world's leading experts on national identification systems with both global and also region-specific expertise from Africa, Latin America, and Asia. We look at the foundational architecture of national identification. What are these systems designed to achieve? What are the legal and political frameworks in which they're embedded? And what are the modalities through which they operate? And what are the targets that they've set for themselves? But we, before we start our examination, however, I think it's good to remind ourselves as a general matter why this topic is of such critical importance, particularly now. With millions of people forcibly displaced from their homes more than ever before in, I think, all of our, or most of our life, uh, lifetimes, either because they're fleeing a brutal and protracted civil war, or because they're escaping from a barbarous or a failed government, and in any event facing uncertainty, hostility, and prolonged displacement, questions of legal identity, of access to a nationality, of possession of documentary proof of one's relationships and one's history could not be more urgent. With this perspective, we can see that these apparently dry and somewhat specialist topics that we may seem to be engaged in are in fact often life-saving issues. Now, like never in the past decade, I think, our questions are the relationship between personhood and reliable proof of that personhood vital. Our discussions may be technical, but they're also profoundly political and ethical. So as we'll hear over the next few days, starting with this panel, national identification is both a process and an outcome, a tool of governance and a deliverable for citizens. At best, effective national identification is a constitutive element of efficient, transparent, and democratic state functioning, a means for leveling playing fields of legal identity, welfare access, and security management. Capacious and well-organized national identification systems can also generate valuable spin-offs in terms of research data, political ac accountability, and civic inclusion. And our conference, I think, over the next few days will examine all of these questions from several different aspects. But now, we start with the systems themselves and their increasingly central role in contemporary state governance. Our panel will, as you'll see, explore this e-identity architecture, its promise, and its current contribution. So thank you again for being with us. Um, the way we're going to organize this and future panels is for each panelist to speak first for about 15 minutes. I'll then, or the panel chair, will then raise a couple of questions and then we'll open it for discussion to the floor. So let me start by very briefly introducing our speakers. And you have full bios in your program, so I won't go on at length. But let me start by introducing our first speaker, who I think is uh, very well known to anybody who works in this field, Alan Gelb. 
He's a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development and was previously the Director of Development Policy at the World Bank and the Chief Economist for the Bank's Africa region. He's written extensively on the topic of national identification. I think many of us in the room are indebted to his clear and um, logical and incisive presentations on the topic over, over time. So please join me in welcoming Alam Gelb. Okay, uh, how do we get this up? Let me see. Do we know how to get the present, sorry, do we know how to get the presentation up? Does it? Um, Go down. Uh, ah, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, it's right on the desktop. For what do we do? Okay. Oh, it's there. Okay. So we just go down. Okay. Th thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie, and my thanks to all the organizers of the conference and the uh, FXB uh, Center for uh, having me here. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, I'm sorry uh, about this, I'll do my best, is to uh, provide a, a sort of a brief overview of the um, status of uh, ID systems as I see them today and what is driving them? What are the needs, uh, the purposes that these ID systems are being created for? Because we have to understand the needs in order to be able to understand what capabilities people are looking for in, from the ID system. I'd like to talk a bit about the trend from ID to EID, the use of digital technology in the ID systems. Then to discuss the question of what do we mean by identity in the first place, and there's a very big debate on this. Um, what does legal identity mean, and is legal identity actually the right con concept for identity from a development purpose? Then to talk about this question of who has it and who doesn't have it, which is a very difficult question. Talk about some of the capabilities and the shortcomings of the systems, and um, a number of issues for the future. So let me proceed with that. The first point is that more and more countries are implementing nationwide programs. I haven't called them national IDs because they're not always national IDs, but programs of national scope. And these are just some estimates. Um, and as you will see from that, according to these estimates, in the low middle income countries, um, the number of programs post 2000 is larger than the number of programs pre 2000. And there are actually very few countries now without a national ID program or some such equivalent program. But a lot of these programs are not really fully operational. Uh, we counted at least 15 that exist more on paper than the process of implementation than, than in uh, established reality. <clears throat> There's also a proliferation of many other ID programs for all sorts of purposes, uh, for elections, voter IDs, for social protection, for the banking system. You name it, there are ID programs for all of these. So in a way, the question is not whether or not to have ID programs, but how these ID programs or how the ID system can better contribute towards inclusive development. Why is this happening? Okay. Um, the, the first concern I think we have to admit is security. It, it, almost in most cases, security is a very, very big driver of nas national ID especially, after 9-11. And the security concern translates into operational requirements for many things. Uh, travel, much more rigorous ID. KYC, know your customer for banks, big issue. How do you know who it is who you're dealing with? What about SIM card registration? Uh, I think something like 84 countries now are either red requiring or considering requiring the registration of prepaid SIM cards. This means there are about 2 billion existing and potential customers who will need to be identified for that purpose. How are they going to be identified? Second um, is the need for better management of all sorts of programs. When I say better, uh, I mean more effective administratively, but also more inclusive right, uh, both go together, of payrolls, 
transfer programs, health programs, social programs. And although the evidence is a bit patchy, it's clear that there's a lot of potential for uh, improvement in this area, if you know who you're dealing with. Third, they're, they're more sophisticated economies. Developing countries, especially, the economies are becoming much more sophisticated. Formal banking systems are growing, um, and the formal sectors are growing. And some countries are switching towards e-services, which has the potential for saving a lot of time, effort, and also increasing inclusion. What about migration? Uh, we have probably more than a billion people now who are migrants, including a quarter of a billion who are international migrants, they need portable document, documentation or credentials, right? Multi-party elections. Uh, there's been a huge growth in the frequency of multi-party elections recently, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. There used to be about one a year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now they're over seven a year, right? So you need to know who is voting. More drivers. On the supply side, the development of ICT and particularly digital biometrics. Uh, this has led to vastly more capable systems and increased supply. And the, the industry has moved from a sort of a forensic security orientation towards a broader applications. And the technology change here is still very rapid. So what might be the leading edge in the future is not necessarily the same as what we see the leading edge today. Finally, support from the international community. Um, when we looked at ID programs um, globally, donors funded about half of the ones we looked at. We looked at 160 different programs uh, in one paper. And the, the support from the international community mostly focused on particular programs and problems rather than on systems, right? So it was either... Um, uh, a voter ID, or it was a social ID, or it was a banking ID, very often. And they're dominantly in these cases, there is one institution, and Mia is on the stage, I must point out, that the Inter-American Development Bank has a record of supporting civil registration. I don't think any of the other development banks did, so they were the first. Um, and so one of the consequences of this is it's contributed to wasteful and incompatible systems. And uh, this is a situation where there aren't really any standards on identification, right? This is hopefully beginning to change. And I think there's a growing consciousness uh, outside of the Inter-American Development Bank uh, on the importance of having a more systematic approach towards these sort of issues. Um, but it's still not focused and strategic across countries. Um, as I see it, um, there's a process of evolution of the, these systems across countries where most country systems have started off at the bottom of this tree, which I've called village ID. It's where identification is lateral, it's personal, it's based on who knows you locally. We just came back from Ethiopia. I was with Robert Palacios, a colleague who I owe a lot to in my work. And the Ethiopian system is very much of this type. It is still very much village level ID, highly organized. And then, of course, as people get mobile, communities break down, you end up with a sort of top-down, central, vertical ID that we think about. And now there are some signs going to the top of the tree that we may be moving towards another kind of identification system, which I've called an e-village ID, where it is um, trusted third parties or electronic communities which are providing a basis at least for authentication. I, I'm not sure I yet believe it can be for identification. But there's a sort of a, a, a process going on in these directions. Almost all of the new programs going in use technology. Um, digital biometrics and e-credentials. These are some estimates from the industry gathered from different conferences. and. Um, one is on the percentage of um, e-national IDs, and the other is on the percentage of e-ID cards. And you'll see that, roughly speaking, in 2010, about half were paper and half were electronic. And today, um, probably more than 80% are. So paper is, is dying. It's uh, electronic systems now. And the developing countries are applying this technology, often more sophisticated technology than you will see in the developed countries. And that's partly, of course, because they don't have legacy systems which are quite as well entrenched as in the rich countries. Now, what about identity? 
Um, Identity is, I think, very difficult to define when you, when you really get into it. Um, I've certainly been struggling with this for a while because we talk about legal identity. We, in, in earlier work with Julia Clark, we tried to develop a concept of official identity that was broader so as not to focus on the legal status of the individual. For many purposes, you don't need the legal status of the individual. For a driver's license, you simply need to know that the person is qualified to drive or to receive a contract, uh, a social transfer, or to be in a health program. And it's irrelevant as to what their legal status actually is. Um, and there are some very strange uh, inconsistencies within countries. Many countries, the voter card is the most commonly held form of ID. But it doesn't necessarily imply that someone is recognized as a citizen, even if you have a voter card, right? You have to go through more processes to be a citizen. How on earth can you have a situation where a voter card is not evidence of citizenship, but that's how it is? What about a birth certificate? Um, does this represent legal ID if it doesn't actually represent uh, anything in terms of citizenship? Because many countries don't give citizenship on the basis of birth certification. Um, what about a pension card? How do we think about that? So there are a lot of credentials floating around. And one question that is quite important for development is, do we care about status or do we care about function? And those are very different things. We can look at ID from the perspective of function, what it does, and we can look at it in terms of status. So in the um, Sustainable Development Goal 16.9, um, <coughs> speaking of function, that uh, identification, legal identity, uh, or identity, let's put it that way, is directly related to at least 10 other SDGs. So we can look at the identity question uh, as being uh, an instrument towards many of the other SDGs in ways that do not necessarily reflect whether it's, quote, legal or not. Um, and then there's some numbers, which are very difficult numbers as to how many people have not been registered at birth. That's probably a, a reasonable estimate. Very difficult estimate on how many people lack legal identification. This is from work with Mariana Dahan, who's here, I think. Um, but of course, it's difficult because of the question of what do you mean by legal identity in the first place. Um, voter registration is often very high, although some goals, some roles will include ghost voters. And often you find a situation where voter rolls are very large, but there are very few people who have the national ID. ID. And so um, the, the voter programs show that these, pro, these identification programs can actually be rolled out very rapidly. Uh, and that's happened in many countries, right? Provided the requirements are not too strict and provided there's really a demand for the credential. But if there isn't demand, and if there isn't demand for a national ID, if it's not used for anything, people don't come forward to enroll. So thinking about the demand is very important as well as thinking about the supply. Um, there are a lot of identity architectures. Sorry, how am I doing? Okay, a lot of identity architectures. We, we, we tend to think of a standard OECD model starting off from birth registration and then extending down through the various stages of documentation towards an ID. And some developing countries have this architecture and some don't. Uh, some are integrated across birth and civil registration and national ID, and then those systems are used for all these kind of other functional purposes too. But others don't have these uh, established systems of birth registration, and they have to somehow make up a population register uh, without it. So they use various mechanisms of mass enrollment or enrollment through functions. Some countries have a disconnected set of functional IDs. And so um, uh, the question is, what are the criteria for, um, for we would judge a system by? And we've asked three questions. Is it a strong identity? Is it robust? Can it be stolen easily? Uh, most of us would agree that that's desirable because we would not want our identity stolen. Um, is there high coverage? We'd like that too. We'd like this to be inclusive. I mean, it's no accident that the people who don't have ID are typically the poorest and most uh, isolated people in the country. Uh, identification is not a problem for elites. Uh, you won't find any problem for the elites in the countries about not having ID. And then is the identity integrated into a range of applications? And then this is where I think the controversy comes. 
because some countries favor highly integrated systems with a single number spanning everything, and other countries resist this. And so that, to me, is the big question where we have to think about the political and social judgment. And here's a picture with some of the architectures that we've tried to draw, contrasting a country like Peru, which has a highly integrated system, running from birth to national ID, which is used for almost everything, to a country like Indonesia, where you have a somewhat less connected ID, um, or Pakistan, where you have a highly connected ID, but it doesn't have a stronger birth basis, birth registration basis as Peru. And then you get a country like the Philippines and some other countries where you have many different sets of IDs which don't necessarily interact with a common number or a common linkage. So these are some of the differences and the fractures. So what are some of the common challenges in strengthening these ID systems? Well, obviously strengthening the birth registration so that it can provide a basis for the ID system is very important. And this may involve integrating it into one technically strong authority, sometimes going from the ID side back into the birth registration. And some countries have done this, um, uh, strengthening their systems so that you end up with essentially one number, one life cycle number from birth, right? Some countries have begun to move their national registration much younger, right? The ADA, for example, is registering children as young as five with biometrics. And um, Mexico has also registered children as young as five. And from an identification perspective, if you're going to have a system like that, there are some advantages because you are beginning to lock in an identity at a much younger age, long before anybody's were thinking about identity fraud. Not everybody will like that alternative, but it is an option. The second is to defragment, to create a more coherent uh, EID system with good access and capability. And they're here there are different approaches. In some cases, you can build directly on an existing ID. Some countries will have a good system that needs to be improved and made more useful. Some countries um, have been trying to create uh, an identity baseline using a very rapid enrollment process. I mean, India, I'm sure we're going to hear about India. The Adha is one example. But there are other examples like these voter IDs which could be used as a basis for creating a, a more coherent ID system if a country chooses to do so. They've also been rolled out very quickly. A lot depends on the initial conditions and the political realities in the country. But it does require some strategic planning and ensuring that whatever you do, there should be demand for it. Because if there isn't demand, it's not really going to do much good. There are some risks. I'm sure we'll talk about it. In, in our work, we tend to think of three categories. The category of exclusion, either because ID is a barrier to access of services rather than facilitating, or nationality-related discrimination. Misuse of data. And uh, I should note, only about half of developing countries have data privacy laws. And many of those that have probably don't have the capability to implement them very well. So that's an issue. And then waste, the fact that in many of these systems, uh, there is a lot of waste and they're probably not cost effective. So some implications. I think we need to know much more across countries on country situations and the performance of these systems in various dimensions. This is still a very much evolving area. Every country is different. There are several models, many models. We, we may not have a perfect system. I don't think one can prescribe a perfect system to a country, but one can suggest criteria which make sense and then look at a system and see if it's actually able to deliver. What about standards? Um, I think there will be a question of whether this area needs more development of standards, perhaps for technologies and for, for credentials to enable whatever these systems are producing to be used for cross-border travel. Harness the power of demand. Um, demand, as I said, is very important. And one of the approaches of going first with ID systems and linking them to demand is a very powerful process. Um, there clearly needs to be more coordination, um, particularly among development partners, I think, um, who are now grappling with this question about how to approach things because there are just so many examples of incoherent systems sometimes being actually developed and supported by the same entity in the same country for a program but broken up in ways that you lock in and you have very high costs. So thank you very much. <clears throat>
Thank you very much, Alan. That was quite fascinating. I think uh, problematizing uh, the notion of identity is a very fundamental place to start in a conference like this. But thank you also for raising some of the other uh, conundrums about what the basis for for, uh, for, for sort of data storage and, and, and uh, gathering should be. I mean, I think these are many questions that we will come back to, but thank you so much. So our second speaker has already been referred to is Mia Harbitz. Mia was until very recently um, the lead specialist in identity management um, and identity uh, registries at the Inter-American Development Bank and is really uh, the person who is responsible for the IDB being uh, the lead bank in, in, in promoting uh, comprehensive civil registries in, in the continent. So she's really worked uh, very hard to develop a system of, of um, identity inclusion, I think. Um, over her, her long career, she designed and managed uh, development projects that modernized and strengthened the capacities for civic and identification registries in Latin America. Um, uh, so she's she worked on a whole range of different projects. Uh, Mia, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Jackie, and good afternoon to all. Let's see if I can figure this one out. So I will, I will get uh, back to the beginning of what identity means. And as Jacqueline said in uh, her introduction, I come from this from a, a project management uh, angle and had the opportunity to actually uh, develop this topic in the Inter-American Development Bank in the context of projects and programs. And uh, when we started this work, uh, we found that the under-registration rate uh, for births, zero to five years, was about 78%. Today, Latin America is one of the better uh, examples of uh, birth registration with a birth registration rate of uh, about 94, according to the latest data from UNICEF. Uh, the initial work, that was done on this uh, was in, on birth registration because we were able to establish a baseline for what we were doing given that we had uh, the multiple uh, indicator cluster surveys to establish at least some kind of uh, a number for regi birth registration. And from there, uh, we took it to civil identification and then looking at identity management systems. If we are to look at the latest numbers from UNICEF, there are still 230 million children without birth registration in the world today. That is the combined, that number uh, is the collective population of Italy, Argentina, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Belgium, Kenya, and Namibia. I mean, it's not a small number. And not having these births registered will also skew the vital statistics. So the birth or civil registration uh, is not a novel concept. Uh, as Alan alluded to, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, you know, identity management still happens at the village level. But in earlier times, life was lived in uh, villages, and everyone was familiar with their surroundings and the people around them. As towns developed into cities, people continued to live in neighborhood, and there was really little need for complex registries. But over the centuries, uh, political factors have changed that. Conscription, tax collection, revolutions led to the need to know who is who, or who was who, and where uh, people lived. Uh, Korea's uh, registry dates back to the ninth century. 
And uh, during this period, laws were codified, civil service system was introduced, and a movable type printing press was invented, uh, perfect for any record keeping. And by the time this Goryeo dynasty ended, in Europe, the church is, uh, was busy uh, registering baptisms, marriages, and deaths. And the French Revolution, uh, what they took, when that happened, they took the registers away from the church and gave it to the municipalities. And there, uh, the Principe de Nationalité uh, came into play that uh, civil registration was linked to nationality. Now, fast forward to the UN definition of what the civil registry is. It is defined as the continuous, permanent, compulsory, and universal recording of the occurrence and characteristics of vital events pertaining to the population as provided through decree or regulation in accordance with the legal requirements of a country. So it is really, you get a legal uh, recognition, a legal identity from birth, and this, in addition to uh, giving a birth certificate, um, which is a legal document, uh, the civil registry, birth registration, is also responsible for this, um, vital statistics. So when it works, and people do get the birth certificate and can access health, education, and other public and private services, uh, it functions well and establishes the, both the legal, social, and cultural relationships between the individual and society. Civil identification uh, is the verification, registration, management, and conservation of personal data of citizens with the goal of establishing a unique identity. Civil identification includes all of the data from civil registration on that particular citizen, as well as other attributes such as a unique number and or biometrics. And this is the basis, it's basis for uh, verification of identity, be it through a passport, identity token, or a national identity or identification document. And the medieval practice uh, with seals used as identity tokens in the signing of deeds for transfer of rights or passage through a territory was actually the forerunner for the modern national state with its claim to right to know all individuals on its territory or those who pass or enter through um, based on credentials such as passports or national identity card. Uh, use of biometrics isn't new either. Using fingerprints as a tool for identification is itself an ancient practice. Uh, dating back more than 3,000 years to Babylonia, where fingerprints were used to sign on clay tablets for business transactions. Uh, Egypt have all, has also, in Egypt, they've also found records of signing by, by fingerprints. Um, the Egyptians were also good at record keeping, uh, conducting national censuses, both for conscription purposes, but also for keeping track of uh, their cattle. So, um, as Alan uh, mentioned in his presentation, technology uh, is moving really fast. Uh, the technology for identification purposes is moving really, really fast. But the civil registry is still considered something of an ugly duckling in the, uh, in the governance uh, environment. First, they, it's underappreciated and underfunded. And this is not a minor consideration or problem because uh, civil registries in themselves uh, generate very little revenue and most of their funding uh, uh, is allocated through the national budget. 
and rising demand for universal, efficient, and secure uh, birth registration and secure birth certificate that in turn are the breeder documents for national identity cards or passports, um, require a very close look at the financial sustainability for the civil register. Uh, because free universal birth registration, which is called for in the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, presumes that budget is available to carry out the task. Unfortunately, that is very rarely the case. Secondly, the ability of the civil registry to operate efficiently is further undermined by the push for costly national identification schemes. These are geared in most cases towards the population 18 and older. So hence the need to look at identity management systems holistically. So just a quick overview of what a birth registration process is. The notification is usually done by, or ideally, I should say, done by a health worker once a birth has occurred. And this is an administrative procedure. The parent then has to make a declaration to the civil registry and for the registrar to enroll the child, register all the biographic data of that individual. This will also produce the civil, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the vital statistics. And this is a legal process. Uh, birth registration is mostly straightforward if one or both parents are nationals of the country where the birth occurred. But it's not necessarily straightforward if only one parent is a national. If the mother is of a different nationality or the father is a different nationality, this can cause that the child is not recognized as a national. And uh, it becomes even more complicated when none of the parents are national, refugees or irregular immigrants. Uh, most countries, I should say a majority of the countries in the Americas, uh, they have use solely, so anyone born in that territory will have um, a nationality, but this is becoming increasingly difficult in a number of countries. Uh, birth certificate is a, is a legal document, and uh, there is a strong uh, push towards uh, moving from paper-based to digital record keeping. This, is, this can be a very costly undertaking because most countries do have some form of civil registry birth register. And to digitize and digitalize these records um, in a way that they can be made searchable and be linked to a national identity or an e-identity uh, is also something that um, a lot of countries will struggle with given the cost of uh, the undertaking. The legal identity, uh, this discussion around legal identity and its importance for the sustainable development goals um, was, uh, has been, um, uh, laid down in uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16.9. Uh, while I was at the Inter-American Development Bank, we had an extensive discussion about what is legal identity. That, uh, that discussion goes back to, uh, I think, uh, 2008, 2009, when we uh, published some papers on that. But this definition uh, has at least helped us uh, operationally. Whatever you know, the definition or agreement on what legal identity is, it does start with birth registration. And the success of uh, this indicator, uh, this goal, will depend upon the country context. It will depend upon the clarity of institutional responsibilities and interinstitutional relationships, the maturity of the institution, 
the transparency for allocating um, uh, budgets for, oper uh, for operations and investments, and clear roles in the civil registry itself, and external and internal accountability mechanisms. So to sum up, uh, the work that uh, we have done, uh, both when I was at the Inter-American Development Bank and now that I am an in-house consultant uh, in the World Bank on the ID4D initiative, uh, the legal frameworks for civil registration, civil identification are out of date in most countries and need to be uh, updated. Uh, in the um, context of governance, it's necessary to streamline coordination between uh, both state and public institutions, uh, standardized, pro standardized processes and procedures to avoid duplications. This can happen very often uh, when the systems are uh, decentralized, that a family may move from one district of one state to another and re-register because it's too expensive to go back to where the child was born to get a duplicate of a birth certificate when the child needs access to health services or start school. Uh, the, a unique number will be very helpful throughout life uh, to um, access benefits and services. And if not integrate databases, at least operate uh, between databases for uh, service deliveries. Maximize the use of technology and standards. There are standards for uh, civil registration. There are standards for uh, identity tokens, there are standards for interoperability that um, are being used throughout the world. And then communicate, 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 both to citizens, users, and between uh, line ministries, and with the private sector, obviously. So uh, the move from paper, ink, and calligraphy to digital records is happening. And uh, I think at this point in time, we do have a unique opportunity to support the countries um, to develop both national identity policies, but also to get the whole registration process right from the start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mia, for, for, for that presentation. I think you've uh, mentioned some items which will be very interesting for us to pursue in the discussion, the sort of relative merits of civil registration versus national um, identity systems and the question of really the relationship between particular documents like birth registration and, uh, and identity. So these, I'm sure, are topics we'll come back to, but thank you. Our next speaker is Tariq Malik, who was the, uh, who is the former chair, was the chairman of the National Database and Registration Authority of Pakistan. Um, he was uh, responsible for a massive rollout of biometric of biometric systems and uh, a rollout that, in the case of Pakistan, resulted in the registration of over 121 million citizens. Um, I'm not sure in what space of time. But he um, has been credited with really uh, revolutionizing the use of, of, um, of data systems in, in Pakistan. And one of the um, main targets, or one of the targets, one of the applications of this, this uh, system has been uh, to really go after particular types of, of law offending. And in particular, in his case, um, uh, CNN referred to him as a man on a mission. He identified 3.5 million tax evaders in Pakistan, and the technology that he developed is now being used elsewhere too. So clearly, uh, in terms of um, some of the goals of, of national identification systems, uh, tracking uh, crime and tracking uh, tax evasion is, is certainly an important one. So, uh, Mr. Malik, thank you very much for joining us.
Thank you, Jackie, um, for the kind words. Let me find my presentation. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, today I am going to discuss uh, Pakistan's national identification system, which is uh, quite old. Pakistan's national ID system is about 41 years old uh, and was uh, sort of best kept secret, uh, but no more. Uh, I'm going to introduce it to you today and relate it with our topic in uh, political, legal, and civil framework. Uh, I am not going to go into a lot of uh, history that what a legal ID is. I guess, uh, you know, Mia has uh, introduced us uh, the whole uh, life cycle, and I will start where she has finished, that how IDs can be instrumental in good governance for the, go uh, for the government. The success story of NADRA uh, triggered many ID systems that we see around the world uh, on the horizon. And uh, so, uh, and we have now international framework, uh, you know, uh, where we have United Nations uh, goal number 16, 16.9, and World Bank has an initiative, ID4D, uh, Identification for Development. But I just want to uh, mention that, uh, you know, national ID systems are not just about enrolling the unique identities of the citizens and then stacking them in a database. That is a good start. But it can be deployed to strengthen three critical ingredients for a minimally effective state. Uh, empowerment, service delivery, and state capacity. In the interest of time, I would like to focus on these three aspects of governance in relation to Pakistan's successful development and application of the biometric database of its uh, citizen. So as I told you that, uh, you know, Pakistan's ID uh, program is 41 years old. But in uh, 2008, when I joined NADRA, uh, it was not that I was quite, uh, you know, bright or intellectual. There were no takers for that position. <laughs> in 2008, the registration was quite low. It was a passive database left with two months of salary. It, has, uh, it was producing plastic, special plastic called Teslin-based ID cards. These were forgeable IDs. Uh, and it was quite closed organization. Um, you know, the program started in 1974, uh, but, uh, it, you know, in 2001, uh, President Musharraf uh, issued an edict, an ordinance, and uh, combined two organizations, National Database and Nation, uh, National Database Organization and National Registration Authority to form it one. The NADRA chairman is effectively Registrar General of Pakistan, so on every ID he signs, he or she signs. NADRA stands for National Database and Registration Authority. But when I took the charge, I said no to government funding, so there is zero uh, dollar in government budget, it's a very self-reliant organization because I uh, establish uh, a company called NADRA Technologies Limited Company, wholly owned by NADRA, which helped uh, Nigeria to issue its uh, identity management, uh, issue its ID card and uh, identity management system. We uh, won the project of, uh, you know, Kenya, passport issuance system, Bangladesh driver's license, Sri Lanka ID card, uh, Sudan civil registration system. So not only NADRA reformed its own system, but helped the other countries to uh, come up with their ID system. So uh, we earned a lot of foreign exchange, and so that company earns the revenue, and it has a concession statement, uh, uh, concession uh, agreement with uh, NADRA, and that's how it is uh, very self-reliant. Uh, 
company. But right now, what Nadra is, uh, I would just want to show you a, a video uh, of two, uh, three minutes so that you can judge yourself. The world population has already hit the 7 billion people mark, and as the size of global population swells, it is expected to bring forth new challenges to all of us. The implications of this fact are myriad and complex, calling for solutions that are integrated, holistic, and well-coordinated. It is therefore aptly being asserted that in a world of 7 billion, everyone counts. National Database and Registration Authority, NADRA, Pakistan's flagship database and registration organization, has been into this very business for over a decade now. In a short span of time, the organization has progressively enhanced its capability, both in terms of talent and equipment, making it a preferred choice for the integrated ID solutions and citizen registration systems. Measured by measures, NADRA has to date registered almost 92 million of Pakistan citizens, thereby providing a sound platform for good governance, sound policy making, effective crime control, swift disaster management, efficient border control, better trade management, and so on. Some major success stories of NADRA, both nationally and internationally, include computerized national identity cards, Pakistan, machine-readable passports and visas, Pakistan, civil registration system, Sudan, passport issuance and control system, Kenya, national driver's license system, Bangladesh, identity card issuance system, Nigeria, biometric refugee registration system for UNHCR, ETA, electronic highway toll collection for Pakistan's National Highway Authority, electoral rules, Pakistan, conditional cash grant systems, ERA, kiosk and e sahulat Nadra's strength also includes its rapid deployment capacity, the capability to deliver in the shortest timeline, and the ability to innovate solutions. Recent successful examples of these are IDP's registration during SWAT operation and floods, cash disbursement, and Benazir smart card. Today's Nadra celebrates its ability to provide indigenous solutions and expertise in a wide range of areas such as design and implementation of data acquisition applications, local and wide area networks and its use for data transportation, security printing including personalization of all types of security documents, database management and data warehousing, project management, program and project integration, software, web, databases, design and development, financial management of IT projects. Besides these, Nadra's technical team has also developed various data-driven applications which include ID verification through SMS, online verification system, Verisys, registration tracking system, family identification system, biometric access and attendance control systems, phonetic search system, MIS applications, etc. It is these many reasons that have earned Nadra a global repute, which translates into a diverse and happy clientele. These include domestic public sector organizations, corporate entities, foreign governments, donor agencies, and several multinationals. Given the complexity of today's challenges, be it security or border control, be it tourism or crime control, be it civil registration or disaster management, Nadra safely boasts of just the right kind of skill set, combination, and technological prowess. Nadra's young and youthful workforce, 80% of whom are between 25 and 40 years of age, its heavy investments in research and development, its preparedness to innovate, and its fearless approach towards challenges makes Nadra an ideal partner to make things happen for you. Nadra, a catalyst for change. So this is a brief video of what an ID program actually uh, can do. So
so here is the story. First, the uh, quantitative achievement. Nadra has registered more than 120, uh, 121 million Pakistanis with 10 fingerprints, digital photographs, and a variety of other bet, uh, attributes. It says 97 because 97 is, are the adult population and rest of them are children. There was a massive effort including, this was a massive effort including, uh, you know, involving 537 offices, 250 mobile registration vans fitted with state of art equipment, 60 man pack units, trackers. I had hired mountaineers to register remote constituencies. So the result was registration sold to 98% with a stunning increase of 104% in female registration, uh, 3 million minorities, uh, and Pakistan is the first Muslim country which has recognized the identity of transgenders. So we uh, gave the cards to the transgenders uh, and special per uh, persons and vulnerable communities were registered in the database. So. Uh, the identity management strategy was simple. You have facial recognition system, you have automated finger identification system, and you have data processing rules, validation checks, and on that you have Nadra's identity management system. So be it identity cards, passports, driver's license, civil registration, documents like birth, death, marriage certificates, or social protection, conditional cash grant programs, everywhere your identity is uh, same. So the most important story is how one of the largest multi-biometric citizen database was deployed to reconnect the state's relationship with its citizen. This matters in a country described as a fragile state where no census has taken place for the past 17 years. So mapping the unique identities of citizens can be powerful tool in extending voting rights, providing access to financial services, distributing uh, uh, cash transfers, and combating corruption. The result is a remarkable empowerment of ordinary people. So I call it empowerment because for empowerment one needs to look no further than the use of biometrics to sanitize voters list as uh, you know Alan and Mia had already alluded to. When we reconcile the manual voters list of 2007 with the multi-biometric citizen database of Nadra, the results as you can see were truly astounding. Nearly 37.1 million entries were incorrect. This is a little less than 50% of the entire electoral role. Nine million voters were registered multiple times, and 15 million had no matching identity in Nadra's uh, database. For the first time, we developed a voters list that carried the photographs to, of voters to reduce the risk of electoral fraud. With the support of Election Commission of Pakistan, a mobile uh, phone service was launched to verify polling information of voters. Nearly 60 million voters checked their vote registration and polling station information on their mobile uh, phones. So this is uh, regarded as one of the best example of citizen uh, engagement. Um, post election complaints of rigging compelled investigation, investigating courts to solicit Nadra's help. The database was used to reconcile counter files of ballot papers. In some cases, the evidence of rigging was so glaring that it put many political power brokers to shame. In one constituency, one male person voted 310 times from a woman-only polling station. The election obviously was recalled. Let me turn to the second key experiment, uh, this time in improving social uh, service delivery. When World Bank's poverty scorecard survey was conducted in Pakistan, Nadra digitized it. It reconciled it with biometrics database that facilitated the compilation of one of the first poverty databases. 
This database was being used today to extend financial assistance to over 7 million women through the uh, Benazir Income Support Program. After one-to-one -one biometric matching of beneficiaries, a direct cash uh, transfer program through the use of smart cards has reduced fraud and undercut the role of uh, what I call rent-seeking intermediaries. So you have, uh, the government has such a powerful tool that they can, uh, they can roll out targeted subsidies using data analytics. So higher subsidies for relatively lower income sections and lower subsidies for relatively higher income sections. Um, perhaps the most uh, unsung benefit of such biometric uh, application was the strengthening of state capacity without which the good governance is difficult to uh, imagine. And one area, as uh, Jacqueline mentioned, was the important issue of tax evasion. In a country of like, uh, I think, uh, 180 million, less than 800,000 people pay the tax, and this is criminal. Uh, the biometrics database was used to identify 3.5 million tax evaders who lived in posh localities, uh, you know, made expensive trips overseas and whatnot. And uh, had we collected money from them, that would have uh, outweighed the Kerry Luger assistance and IMF assistance to Pakistan. Uh, so we also identified nearly 25,000 ghost workers, multiple dipping pensioners, proxy prisoners, and those who stole people's uh, mandate. The unintended consequence of this whole exercise was uh, the launch of branchless banking. You know, in Pakistan, 86% of uh, um, population, rural population is unbanked. So we have uh, uh, triggered uh, growth of branchless banking in Pakistan. I can tell from my personal experience how we managed to capitalize on disasters by converting them into opportunities. The floods of 2010 opened such a political space. Even if many political affected peoples lost their ID cards, we were able to mobilize 250 mobile registration vans uh, and send them to disaster struck regions for registration. And when aid in kind was being dropped as immediate relief from helicopters, obviously cash couldn't be. Uh, hence, biometrics were used to verify the identity and proof of life, and more than 100 billion rupees were distributed among 3 million disaster struck families without a penny being wasted in a speedy manner. It revived the local economy, reduced the administrative cost of relief operation, and introduced uh, transparency. Uh, we introduced a new smart card, a new identity document, which has 31 security features. It's a chip-based card. It has Java 2.2.2 uh, application on it, and it has uh, empowered the government and the citizen both in a way that the government uh, can, uh, you know, roll out financial and remittance services, you know, social protection program, health insurance especially, uh, and the card is compliant with IKO 9303 Part 3 Volume 1 requirements, so it's a valid, uh, you know, uh, document, uh, travel document, uh, so to speak. So all of this is promising, but technology uh, in the end uh, is only a tool. Strong political will is needed to deploy it in the interest of citizenry. As a repository of private data, biometrics database need proper legal framework or proper legal protection, if you will. This is not possible without effective checks and balances on the powerful. Uh, Nadra was created with a mere ordinance, an edict of a dictator, but I took it to the parliament for proper legislation and proposed punishment for anybody who compromised the privacy of a citizen database. By directly connecting with the citizenry, national identification systems threaten 
vested interest. As a chairman of NADRA, I felt on several occasions that important power brokers, both within and outside of the government, were keen to circumscribe our role of data gathering uh, organization or agency. NADRA's role in identifying electoral fraud was a tipping point that forced political functionaries to assume direct control over the affairs of semi-independent authority. Few sig citi significant citizen-centric applications have been launched during the uh, last two years. But, uh, you know, uh, the future is still promising. To conclude on a sobering note, even with the fastest and most efficient technologies, reform is likely to be a gradual and incremental affair. Nevertheless, technology remains a good partner of policy reform, and I, I feel that uh, national identification system and biometric databases are important linchpin in these debates. I thank you very much. Thank you very much Eric, for that uh, really uh, startling presentation. Um, it, the, the scope of, of the work that you did is, is, is really quite staggering and I'm sure we will come back to it and to also to, to probe some of the points you made about the extent to which the technology can really facilitate political change. For example, how many of those tax evaders were really prosecuted and how much money was recovered would be interesting to learn, but no doubt that will come up in the discussion. So our, our final speaker is Bronwyn Manby, who is an independent consultant and visiting fellow at the London School of Economics Center for Study of Human Rights. She has uh, in the past worked for the Open Society Foundation, Open Societies Foundations, and for Human Rights Watch. She um, is a widely regarded and esteemed expert on issues of citizenship and nationality uh, law and um, human rights more generally in, in Africa in particular. And uh, she's written a lot on questions of statelessness and um, differences in, in, uh, in African nationality law between countries. Um, she is currently involved in ongoing advocacy for the adoption of a protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the right to a nationality in Africa. So this is a, a very uh, important uh, sort of um, application, if you like, of this, this field that we're talking about. So thank you very much, Bronwyn, for being with us. Um, good evening, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the interaction of the debate around legal identity with discussions around nationality and statelessness and, and how the two relate to each other. And in particular, how you decide if an undocumented person is also a person who lacks a nationality. Um, a person without documents is relatively easy to understand. A person without nationality is a question of, uh, which is not only a question of facts. You can say, do you have a birth certificate? Do you have an ID card? And if the answer is no, the person is undocumented. But it's not therefore clear that they're also uh, stateless. That is to say, they don't have a recognized nationality. There is a definition of a stateless person in international law, uh, which comes from the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless persons, which was adopted just three years after the adoption of the UN Convention on, on Refugees and was initially, in fact, going to be part of the same convention, but comes out of very much of, of the same debate, the same discussion in the post-Second World War. Um, and in that context, a stateless person means a person not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. I could talk for 15 minutes about this. I could talk for an hour about this definition. But suffice it to say um, that the UNHCR issued guidelines in 2012 um, which is you know, 15 pages of discussion of just this definition. And the important conclusion thereof is that it's a mixed question of fact and law, which is something contested by a lot of states. Uh, and there is a whole discussion about the difference between de jure and de facto statelessness, which for UNHCR's purpose is now a dead discussion. That, that, that they talk about stateless people. And on the one hand, you have fact, which 
uh, just to talk about Africa, and we will, I'm sure, come back to this. Many other presentations will come back to this. You have many millions of people who are undocumented in sub-Saharan Africa. Birth registration, on average, is below 50%. And in some countries, Liberia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Malawi, Tanzania, it's below 10% of the population birth registered. National identity cards are becoming much more common and, for example, will be compulsory for the whole of West Africa from next year. But even in countries where they have theoretically been compulsory since 1960, since independence, uh, you can have, for example, in Guinea, estimated coverage uh, of about 20% of adults carrying a compulsory national identity card. Um, you have weak administrative systems, you know, discrimination on racial, ethnic, linguistic, gender grounds, very widespread. Decisions are conducted at very low level and with very poor training. And you have a lot of arbitrary decision making. On the law, this again is something that I could talk about for hours. Um, but just to say there are the important distinctions between nationality that you get attributed at birth as of right by operation of law and then nationality that you can acquire later as an adult, although in some contexts also as a child. For example, an adopted child, a child that has been adopted from another country acquires nationality or might not, in fact, in some countries have no provision related to adopted children. So an adopted child cannot uh, get that nationality. But more important for these discussions is really the nationality uh, that you get attributed at birth. And then there is, of course, the familiar distinction between whether you get nationality based on your location of your birth or from your parents. Usually, uh, there is a mixture. Common in many African countries is a system known as double your soli. So if you are born in the country and you have one parent also born in the country, you are automatically a national from birth. Some African countries, for example, Ghana, if you have one grandparent who is a citizen, you, you acquire nationality. So there are mixtures of this, but, uh, you know, and then again, there's a, a presumption there, or there should be a presumption, according to international law, for children of unknown parents, and not just abandoned infants, but the UNHCR guidelines for any child found up to the age at which they can start explaining who they are, what they know about their own history, say seven-ish. Um, but many countries, you know, there are a dozen countries in Africa that have no provision related to abandoned children. Therefore, those children cannot get a national ID card. They are not citizens when they become adults, uh, assuming a national ID card is required. Highlight one thing about nationality by acquisition. Naturalization procedures are effectively not available in Africa with the exception of South Africa. And actually, even in South Africa, they've stopped publishing statistics. Um, but uh, in Nigeria, for example, a country of 150 million people, around about 100 people naturalize every year. Uh, Britain, a country of 65 million people, around 200,000 people naturalize every year. This means that, and I will come back to this later, that the citizenship from birth becomes much more important. If it's impossible to acquire nationality as an adult, what is attributed at birth is therefore much more important. There are a lot of gaps in the law. Gender discrimination is becoming uh, much rarer. Um, 54 African countries, I think 42 now allow equal transmission from mothers and fathers, um, but it still, uh, it still does exist. Uh, racial and ethnic discrimination, there are about 10 or 12 states, depending on how you read the law, uh, which have explicit provisions in the law. I mean, this is leaving aside questions of actual officials discriminating in practice, but in the law, you have up to around a dozen countries. Uh, Liberia is the most famous one. Uh, you cannot be Liberian unless you are Negro or of Negro descent, with no definition as to what that means. Um, and you have around half of Africa's countries have relatively strong rights uh, based on birth in the territory, um, but there are quite around a half that really you have almost no rights based on birth in the territory and in some contexts not for even for abandoned children whose parents are unknown and if you think in the post-conflict countries it's very common for children to not know who their parents are um, but also there are issues around orphans and so forth as well. And most African countries now, a large majority now allow dual nationality but there's still a very strong misinterpretation of the law. So if it is believed that you could have the right to another nationality, you will be told that you don't have the nationality of the country where you find yourself. Um, and that there's this inter common interpretation that dual nationality is not allowed, even when the law has been changed to say that it is allowed, because that interpretation or that change of law is kind of assumed to apply the, to the people who've become Americans or the people who've become British or the people who've become French. 
but not the people who are both Ivorian and Burkina Bay by birth. They've got one parent from each. And that's like, no, well, then you can't be Ivorian because you are, in fact, Burkina Bay. But if dual nationality is allowed, uh, which it is, even in Côte d'Ivoire, by birth, uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't apply to be a problem. But, in fact, it is apply. Nationality, uh, naturalization is very inaccessible, as I've already said. Provisions relating to state succession, that is to say the transfer of sovereignty at independence, who became a national at independence, and also, for example, the secession of South Sudan, the secession of Eritrea, the transfer of the Bakassi Peninsula between Nigeria to Cameroon, all create massive problems, a failure to regulate, in, very, in, in many cases, effectively regulate who became a national at that time. No, no systems for identification of, of stateless persons. Uh, and we also have, um, what do you do with the nomads? Uh, which I will come back to again, but there's really the laws were of course all based on European models. You have millions of people in Africa following a nomadic lifestyle and really no legal conceptualization enabling them to be, uh, uh, to be managed and to think about how their nationality would work. Um, and finally, uh, of course, the top level law, the constitution or the actual statute requires administrative regulations, decrees and so forth to implement them. And lots of countries have no rules that are effective around, uh, for example, alternative forms of proof if there is no birth registration. So if you don't, if you're in a country where there's 10% birth registration and you need to prove that you are a national, there's no, there's very often no system at all to say how does that work. Some countries, you know, there are exceptions, and actually the, Fr the French civil law countries tend to work much better with this, because for the f in the francophone countries, nationality belongs to the courts. It belongs to the Ministry of Justice, whereas in the anglophone countries, it belongs to the Ministry of the Interior, and it's a different mindset and a different way of thinking about things, which creates quite significant differences on the ground. So who is left at risk of statelessness? Um, and these are groups uh, by, that are common to all continents, um, but I suppose you'd probably find most commonalities with, with uh, the Asian um, continent. Uh, but you have migrants themselves, but more commonly uh, the descendants of migrants. So, for example, those people who migrated or were forcibly moved before independence, forced labor into Congo, forced labor into Côte d'Ivoire, um, the descendants of those people are left stateless today. Uh, former refugees. Last year, uh, was spent quite a lot of time in West Africa interviewing people, including, for example, former Liberian refugees in Guinea who you know, left Liberia in 1983. They were two years old. They grew up partly in Sierra Leone. Then they moved to Guinea. They speak English with a Sierra Leonean accent. Their parents are both dead. They've been brought up by somebody else, and they... Liberia, uh, you know, there's a cessation clause, they're no longer refugees, Li you know, there's a process organized by UNHCR to take these people to the Liberian consulate who will then issue them with a passport uh, to recognize them as Liberian. And Liberia says, you know, who is your chief? Where did you come from? What, which school did you go to? Have you got uh, your primary school enrollment card? And they have nothing, they have absolutely nothing. And they can't, so Liberia says, well, we're not, you're not Liberian. And Guinea says, well, they're certainly not Guinean. And these are people who've held a UNHCR refugee card for 20, 30 years, uh, and they can't get rec And so now, where are they? They're, they have nothing. They have no ID document. Uh, similar type of situation where, for example, uh, people who are chucked out of Libya with the fall of Gaddafi, people returning to West Africa, returning to West Africa uh, from Central African Republic to a country of origin of one of their parents, um, and cannot reestablish an identity. And these things, although they shouldn't apply, apply also to the internally displaced. Um, in Nigeria, for example, you know, one and a half million people displaced, um, very low rates of birth registration, nobody has any documentation. Some of them have gone across borders into Niger, and uh, just the documentation, you know, the UNHCR has conducted a survey in Niger, and 60% of the people leaving Nigeria have no documents. And it's not clear, in fact, if they are Nigerian or Nigerian. Uh, and you just have these people, when they return to Nigeria, which is where they say they're from, are going to say, well, no, now we think you're actually from Niger because what were you doing there, uh, and so forth. So there are huge problems there. Uh, now, Africa's famously arbitrary borders 
creates situations where, you know, every time there's an election in Ghana, there's allegation that Togolese are voting in Ghanaian elections, and as a consequence, the, 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 the alleged Togolese, you know, then won't get Ghanaian identity cards, uh, but in fact, they are Ghanaian, or possibly they are both, but because they could be both, there's a suspicion that they are neither. And you know, both countries sees, or the officials of both countries, sees their responsibilities to make sure that nobody fraudulently acquires their nationality, which is a pretty fair uh, ambition. But there's no collaboration between the two to say, well, this person is clearly either Ghanaian or Togolese, or probably both, or possibly both. So let us actually put together a joint commission and decide and make sure that they have at least one of those documents, rather than saying, well, we're not sure, so we can't give it to you. Well, we're not sure either, and the person is left in the middle. Um, same true, uh, already mentioned, the nomad state successions. These populations tend to be relatively, the first two categories here, the migrants and the cross-border populations, tend to be you know, collected, relatively collected in, in uh, one zone. Um, the vulnerable children are scattered uh, everywhere throughout Africa. Um, and father being a foreigner is per perhaps the lowest level of risk with decreasing explicit gender discrimination. But children born out of wedlock are often completely, uh, you know, they can't get their birth registered and everything starts from there. The whole sequence of events that would require them to, to enable them to get identity documents as an adult. Uh, child workers, trafficked, and so forth. I mean, categories of people. But the point here is, you, these people, these are the groups who are at risk of statelessness. In the case of every, any one individual, you're not necessarily going to know until they've tried to get identity cards in various different ways or tried to get documents either in two or three different countries or in two or three different agencies in one country. But Alan has already mentioned it's relatively easy to get a voter's card because the politicians have an interest in making sure that you have a voter's card, but much harder usually to get a national identity card, although one should depend on the other. Um, and deciding if somebody is stateless is, is often actually not that easy. But when it comes down to it, if a person has made multiple applications for documents and has not been able to get them, there is a point where you say, this person is stateless. Um, and then there is, uh, uh, how do you then uh, resolve that person's situation becomes a question of law reform, although also administrative reform. I'm going to conclude with three case studies of how these things uh, interact in practice. Um, the first two, Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria, uh, are situations looking at how national identity card systems have been rolled out. These first two, I don't think the national identity card process has made anything worse, but I don't think it's addressed the problem. In the case of Mauritania, it's an example where I think uh, it's very troubling, in fact, that a, 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 you know, there's a, a national identity card that's been rolled out in a way that is explicitly designed to exclude people. So starting with Cote d'Ivoire, we have here a uh, document from the Morpho website, Morpho being one of the largest uh, biometric ID companies, stating with great confidence that uh, Morpho played a leading role to end a decade-long period of crisis. Um, note the date here, it's October 2014. If we have Amnesty International, uh, three years earlier, which was referring to precisely the period which there was no conflict, according to Morpho, because the ID card was rolled out for the 2010 elections. I don't think that the Morpho identity card made this worse, but it did not solve the problem because it was addressing a different problem. The problem in Cote d'Ivoire is not multiple voting. It is not people voting with somebody else's ID card. That may well happen. It would be a good thing to stop it. The problem in Cote d'Ivoire is the definition of nationality. This is the 1961 uh, original version of the nationality code, which has been amended slightly, but is pretty much the same today. Is Ivorian every individual born in Cote d'Ivoire unless the two parents are foreigners? There is nowhere in the law a definition of foreigner. M uh, a large, uh, before independence, everybody in Francophone West Africa was French. So the people who'd been bought, brought as forced labor from Burkina Faso and elsewhere into Cote d'Ivoire, the people who had migrated on their own, uh, on their own feet into, into Cote d'Ivoire from other French administered territories, 
presumably were not foreigners because they were French. However, possibly you could say, well, if they were attributed to somebody else's nationality, so if they were attributed Burkina Bay nationality at independence, then they were, became Burkina Bay. But absolutely no, no provision related to, no transitional provisions related to that. So that the, uh, and for a long time after independence, the economy was booming. Houphouët Boigny saw himself as a pan-Africanist. Everybody was welcome. The economy crashed, and of course, what happens when the economy crashed? Whose fault is it? It's the foreigners' fault. It's always the foreigners' fault when the economy is in trouble. And here we have the, the lack of a definition of who was foreign. By contrast, you have in Senegal, for example, or in Burkina Faso, if you are born in Senegal, if you are born in Burkina Faso, of one parent also born there, you have that nationality, end of story. So even if the, the, the generation in between has issues, the second generation just becomes Senegalese, becomes Burkina Bay. So it's not that there are no problems in those countries around nationality, but the nationality law allows migrants to be integrated into the country and does not in Cote d'Ivoire. The second example is Nigeria, where they are launching for the second time a national ID card. Um, which is MasterCard branded, um, there has been quite a lot of uh, anxiety, about, shall we put it that way, about the fact that a compulsory national ID card is giving financial data to MasterCard. Um, there's also a quite a lot of uh, anxiety about the fact that in Nigeria, um, you know, famously, these types of um, contracts are an opportunity to make a profit for various people, officially and unofficially. Um, and so you have a multiplication of biometric uh, identity bases, which uh, databases, which uh, also has been much commented on. But for me, the much more fundamental problem with the introduction of a national identity card, which is which is compulsory, and you know, in principle, it's only just being rolled out now, should in principle cover 100% of the population, is the definition of who is Nigerian is really problematic. Um, this is the 1999 constitution. It's the same terms as the 1979 constitution when this definition was introduced. Um, and in essence, the definition of who is Nigerian depends on your belonging to a community indigenous to Nigeria. And there are other provisions in the constitution related to what the Nigerians call federal character. So, for example, the president is obliged to appoint ministers representing the federal character of Nigeria and people indigenous to each state. And the same thing applies at state level and local government level, that you're supposed to spread the jobs around to people who are indigenes of a state. But there is no legal definition of indigene. There is a huge administrative infrastructure that has been built up, but it's, uh, and so you have to go to your local government area and get a certificate, a certificate of indigeneity, which is a, you know, exists in each local government area. But there's no definition, and so different local government areas apply different rules. In some context, contexts, you know, that people will say, well, we, you know, your, your father was the principal of the school here, so yes, we, you know, you grew up here, we know you, we'll give you a certificate of indigeneity. In other places, they'll say, please recite, you know, the complete epic poetry of an oral verse, uh, you know, name the, all the chieftaincy titles uh, that apply in this country, etc., etc. And, you know, if you don't do it in the proper, you know, rural dialect and sound like you grew up in Lagos, you might not, you might be rejected uh, for a certificate of indigeneity. So, I don't think the ID card is, you know, necessarily going to make anything worse, but it doesn't actually address this problem. Uh, it may well have lots of positive benefits as well. The final example, though, is more troubling. Um, again, we have here a, a presentation from Morpho, which is, you know, uh, ID card in Mauritania um, is going to produce all of these good results around population registry, around uh, data, around uh, empowerment, fraud, citizens' rights, and so forth. But here's the perspective from the other side. Um, Mauritania is accused of conducting biometric genocide. Mauritania is a country where the people in charge since independence, in, uh, in fact, yeah, since independence, have been the, um, the Moors, for the name come from, the, the, an old-fashioned name, straight from Shakespeare, it sounds like in English. Um, but uh, Arabic, speaking a dialect of Arabic, fair-skinned people, or relatively fair-skinned people speaking a dialect of Arabic, um, in a country where there are sort of three major population groups, the second population group being former slaves, black-skinned people, but also speaking the same dialect of Arabic, uh, and finally, people speaking uh, 
sub-Saharan African black languages, so Bambara, Soninke, uh, Soninke and, and other languages, um, and f would speak French as a, as a second language. Um, since there has been a program of Arabization and a disempowerment of, uh, of the uh, uh, black Africans, and 1989-1990, there was an expulsion of about 100,000 uh, pe people, uh, some of whom returned on a UNHCR program, some of whom remain in, in Senegal and in, in Mali. Um, but there's now been an introduction of, an, you know, for those who have returned and who those who never left, introduction of this new identity card, which is being deployed in a way to re remove their rights to be Mauritanian. And the background of the introduction Yes, the background of this, uh, this is my last slide, the background is, uh, of, of this um, uh, introduction is that a law reform in which the lines crossed out, basically the two provisions crossed out are, relate to the double your soli, so it's no longer the case that you are Mauritanian uh, if you are, have a one parent also born there. They've also removed um, late birth registration and alternative forms of proving birth. So those people who are most in the informal sector who are at the margins are not going to be able to obtain the new card. Um, so to conclude, um, it has been the case for a long time that new identification systems are a, a danger point for creating statelessness. Um, but it means therefore that the technological solutions have to be accompanied if they are not to have uh, exclusionary consequences with attention to the under underlying law. And if one looks at the SDG target, which is by 2020, 2030, provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. Now, everybody knows what birth registration means, and nobody really knows what legal identity means. But it's pretty clear that this is actually a lesser target. This is, of course, adopted by states than UNHCR's target, which is a campaign by UNHCR, uh, which was launched uh, about a year ago, to end statelessness by 2024, which is to say to provide the legal identity of a nationality six years earlier than the STD target, uh, but for actually much stronger identity, which is that of nationality. And I think if the SDG process of the efforts of advocacy around that do not actually pay attention to the types of priorities that UNHCR are setting, it does risk creating uh, problems as well as, uh, as well as some important benefits as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. That was fascinating and a wonderful way to um, concretize, I think, with these three case studies, some of the real issues about the tension between law and uh, te technolo technology and, and politics that several of the, uh, the speakers have referred to. Since we're running a little short of time, I actually won't ask a question, but I'll open the, the, the um, questions for the floor. Um, all I would say is that I think that um, we really have touched on some of the critical sort of uh, linchpins of this whole area, questions of identity, questions of political will, questions of the relationship between digitization and paper systems and uh, the relative merits of moving lock, stock and barrel into a new system and the cost of that. And then finally, this question of, of you know, what the colonial heritage in so many of these countries delivers and, and how the most vulnerable, if you like, or, or the, the less privileged populations are going to benefit from, from new systems of, of, of national identification. Anyway, thank you all again, and um, the floor is open. Any questions or comments? Oh, yeah, that's right. There are microphones here, so actually if people want to come up to the mics, please, that would be helpful because um, otherwise we won't hear you. And for that matter, if the panelists want to, while people are thinking, if the panelists have questions they'd like to ask each other or to raise, that would be fine too. But we have our first intrepid questioner, so please go ahead, introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, is it on? Uh, my name is Eric Andreessen. I'm a student here at Harvard College. Um, I wanted to kind of dig deeper on the issue of privatization and the role of uh, its interplay with the public sector more. I um, found the example of Nadra really fascinating. And he seemed to do a great job of inclusion and of, of, of doing something that the public se sector wasn't able to. But I'd love to see hear other opinions on limitization or limits of the private sector or maybe conflicts of interest, uh, like MasterCard in Nigeria, for example, where you have these issues of data not, be, not being publicly protected and things like that. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear all of you kind of tackle that. And um, especially looking at 
the role of the private sector when the public sector, when the, the government may not necessarily represent the public interest. So, thank you. Okay, so who'd like to address that? Uh, uh, Alan, why don't you have a start with that, if you, if you like to ask. What's, what is the relationship or the role of the private um, sector, and uh, in particular where, where the public sector may not speak for the whole population? Do you want to start, and then maybe we can hear what the other panelists have to say? Like to, no? sorry, who are you asking? I was asking you. Uh, me? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure. Um, you know, I, it is interesting. Um, the, the private sector is very active in this area. I mean, you go to any of these conferences and there are a lot of vendors um, promoting solutions. And then you're finding that the ID systems are also integrating a lot of functions, some of which like uh, banking functions, for example, um, which can be provided uh, through private vendors. So you get a potential blending of public and private. Um, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear what Tarek says. I mean, I think that one of the lessons that you get from NADRA and also from other countries like Peru is that there is room for an element of uh, commercial motivation in the provision of identification services. Um, I think that the fact that uh, NADRA uh, is, has a certain, has a, a sort of a, a, a profit motive has probably been very helpful in allowing it to uh, be a very successful uh, organization. And I think the same would be true for Peru's ID system, which I think is about 80% funded through fees. And this is not private, it is commercial, but it's not private. So that, I think, is, 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 is very, very interesting, and it's a perfectly a good model to think about. Um, when it comes to blending the, the private sector and the public sector, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit less worried about some of the blending than, than other people would be, because, um, you know, uh, let's say you take Malaysia. Malaysia has a, um, a, smart, a smart ID card with about 50 different functions on it can do about 50 different things. And I don't see why some of those functions cannot be bid out towards uh, private entities that want to include their services uh, within the chips on the cards. But if you have a transparent process and you have competitiveness, and I think the concern in Nigeria uh, about MasterCard would be more whether MasterCard has been handed a monopoly on uh, certain types of services. I think they have the first 13 million of the cards, if I remember right. Uh, so they don't have a permanent monopoly, but in the terms of that, and uh, whether or not that has been uh, something done in the public interest. So I would look at that more carefully, and I wouldn't completely rule it. By the way, I think the optics are terrible. The optics in, 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 in uh, Nigeria are terrible with branding a card with a, a branding an ID card with a, a, a vendor name, right? But to have a service within the card that is a payment system which can use private services, that may be quite acceptable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, if I can make a comment from an operational point of view, it, uh, research and development when it comes to identity management systems are driven by the private sector. Uh, and looking at this from an international financial institution point of view, um, when uh, these projects are being funded, uh, you have to level the playing field for the vendors, the bidders, but you also have to ensure that the country uh, gets um, a fair uh, price and a good system. So, you know, having a balance between uh, what the country needs and what the private sector can offer when a country does not have the capacity itself to develop technical specification for a card system or identity management system and do not have the capacity to uh, decipher and interpret the bids that are coming in. Um, you know, you have to find a balance there. Uh, and uh, the case of Peru, uh, 
Peru has a very interesting uh, identity management system. They have uh, one of the few independent institutions in uh, Latin America. They are, as Alan said, required to um, uh, get their own funding, and they will actually charge for the authentication procedure. So when somebody presents their card in a private bank um, to do any transaction, uh, it's the card is being read, and uh, the RENIAC, the institution, charges a fee, as does uh, the registry uh, services in Ecuador. So there are many ways to collaborate uh, uh, between the public and private sectors in, when it comes to identity management systems. Yes, uh, as is uh, quite evident from Nadra's experience that, uh, you know, we um, appreciate public-private sector and, uh, you know, just as uh, Mia mentioned, you know, R&D mainly comes from pub, uh, private sector as far as vendors are concerned, but we opened, up, opened it up for the private sector in terms of banks, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, telcos uh, in Pakistan. And we created a model in which, you know, private companies can uh, ask Nadra for identity verification and validation. And we have rolled out various applications in public sector domain where we earn our own profit. For example, if you go and apply for a passport, you know, your main uh, data comes from Nadra. Your uh, identity verif verification is done from Nadra, so you don't have to enter uh, all your information again. Uh, so we empowered Passport Office to, uh, uh, to develop, uh, actually we developed an application for Passport Office and we sold it to Passport Office, and but the passport is issued by Passport Office, not Nadra. Similarly, when we identified the voter's identity and we created an electoral role based on the biometric list, uh, we made some money from Election Commission of Pakistan, but we empowered Election Commission of Pakistan to come up with the, uh, a, a voters list which, is, uh, uh, which does not have any inclusion, exclusion error. Similarly, if you open a bank account in, a, uh, in Pakistan, uh, KYC is done by Natra and we earn 35 rupees per KYC. Uh, similarly, if the biometric SIM registration is done, if you want a SIM, uh, you know, the identification verification is done by Natra. So we have rolled out these applications, various applications, disaster management applications, social, net, uh, social safety net applications. We have worked on health insurance, you know, vaccination, recording the vaccination uh, of the children, uh, you know, uh, biometric <coughs> attendance system, you know, access management. And we were creating a whole PKI infrastructure, if you will, uh, you know, public key infrastructure, uh, and working with private sector. But there is a clear line between what they can do and what they can't do, because we uh, carry, uh, Nadra carries a heavy cross uh, of protecting the citizens' uh, private information. Even if some uh, agency, intelligence agency or law enforcement agency has a valid case to have an access uh, of uh, the record, uh, identity record of a criminal, uh, it's not Nadra. Uh, we have uh, a third party validation, which is crisis management cell. So that entity has to make a case to that uh, third party, and only basic information is then uh, released. And with, uh, if the information is released with any entity or party, there is an NDA agreement, non-disclosure agreement. Uh, NADRA is run by a board, and uh, NADRA chairman is one among the equal of uh, members of the board. So any sharing that is done, data sharing with any organization, agency, uh, that is uh, being scrutinized by 
two uh, committees, one in the parliament and one in the Senate also, who periodically review these. I was going for an, uh, a, a legislation where a citizen has a right to ask Nadra that give me a list of agencies who have actually checked my record for what reason. So public-private sector partnership is possible. Uh, and you can uh, enhance state uh, capacity by rolling out these applications, but uh, a clear line should be uh, drawn that who is responsible for what actions. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? No. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. I think this, uh, if there's anybody else, because we're running out of time, um, who wants to ask a question, maybe they, we, we'll just put them together, but if it's you, go ahead and just introduce yourself, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm Layla Magari. I am with the National Democratic Institute. I work on the Gender, Women, and Democracy team. We are interested in national IDs and voter registration and how uh, national IDs uh, can influence women's political participation or have an effect on women's political participation. I'm very interested in the gender dimensions of the work on, uh, of everyone on the panel. Um, I'm a, I'd especially like to hear more from Mr. Malik about how NADRA helped register women to, to vote in Pakistan. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. And uh, here is my response. In 2008, uh, women registration was quite dismal to 20.8 million. Now it has uh, increased more than 104%. Uh, and how uh, we were able to do that we have uh, invested in technology and infrastructure. We have reached out in all the district and uh, tehsils, uh, lower precinct of Pakistan. Uh, not only that, we have addressed the cultural norms of those areas where women registration was uh, very dismal. Uh, and we, How uh, did you do that, actually? Yeah, I was going to tell you that we have opened up 13 women-only registration centers. We, have, uh, we were looking for women drivers for our uh, mobile registration vans, which uh, went into the uh, sensitive areas where even war is taking place. And when we opened the first women-only registration center in Mardan, the first day, 3,000 women uh, showed up uh, for uh, registration. And we said that, you know, we are empowering you with, our, with your own identity. And if there is a case of domestic violence, if you want to vote, you know, you have to have a legal <coughs> identity to do that, even to go for, annual, uh, for uh, once in a lifetime, you know, pilgrimage. Uh, you need an ID and you can't have uh, a passport without that. So a massive public awareness campaign was started with the help of NGO sector. I opened Nadra for NGO sectors. So, and I gave them the targets that, okay, these are the areas. If you have donors money, I want to make sure that you uh, conduct the public awareness campaign and tell us we will send the infrastructure. We will, instead of they coming to us, we will send our mobile vans to uh, those areas. So uh, that helped. And so we were able to add about 30 million women in uh, the electoral role. Not only the women, look at that, uh, 3 million minorities first time in the electoral role. And when I ran the data analytics and told them that you know there are 96 constituencies in Pakistan where minorities have more than 10,000 vote and where the winning margin historically is less than 10,000 vote, it has compelled all the political parties, even the religious political parties, to come up with a very progressive agenda and reach out to the minorities. Thank you. Yeah, Brahmin. Yeah, I mean, just on the gender aspects, in, in relation to nationality law, of course, it's, you know, the children who are affected by gender discrimination tend to be 50% boys and girls. Um, but the discrimination relates to the ability to transmit uh, nationality. But in the, in the context of uh, nationality by marriage, the discrimination usually works the other way around as well. It's the, it's the men who cannot become nationals if they are married to a woman who is a national. But just to pick up on the example of, of, uh, of Nigeria, 
and the indigeneity question. I mean, one of the issues around certificates of indigeneity is that you, that it is clear there is a, a, a document by the Federal Character Commission that, that states that you can't be a dual indigene. So you can't be an indigene of two states inside Nigeria. So women who are married to a man from a different state in Nigeria have significant problems if they are resident in the man's state, not so much in voting, but in terms of ability to access public office. So there's actually been litigation in the Nigerian courts around, in fact, the appointment of a woman judge who's, who was then said, she, because of this pr principle of indigeneity, she could not be appointed a judge in that state because she was not an indigene of that state because she had married into that state from a different state. Um, the court ruled the right way. The court said this is ridiculous. She's a Nigerian. She's got a right. Um, but it is very common in terms of uh, access to, to public office that if you're not an indigene, uh, of, uh, seen as an indigene, and this tends to, uh, ha it has a gender implication. It doesn't only affect women, but that question of can you transfer your indigeneity from one place to another, uh, which is, it particularly affects, uh, affects women, it is nowhere written in any law, but it's very commonly applied. Did you want to say something? Last, last words to me, and then yeah, we'll close. Uh, Last words and brief words, uh, and it has nothing to do with voter rolls. Um, one way to address the under-registration of uh, women and children has been to work through the conditional caste transfer programs, <coughs> where very often the main beneficiary is the either the head of household, if it's a single parent uh, family, or to the female directly. And uh, through these programs, uh, we require that the person who received the benefit has uh, a legal identity document, which has given, uh, this is one of the reasons why there has been an increase in birth registration in Latin America, for instance. But they get legal uh, represent, uh, recognized as, as uh, legal, how do you say that, Bronwyn, uh, subjects of the state by having an identity? No. Mm -hmm. it depends on which country you're in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Latin America, Latin America. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's a great example of uh, Alan's point about demand being uh, important to, um, to, to stimulate uh, the, the, you know, the, the use of these in, in documents. Well, thank you so much, all of you. Um, please thank our panel, and thank you for joining us. And please join us next time for the reception.